Good morning. Thank you for being here. Time for us to begin. I have you bow with me, please. I'll have a little prayer before we start. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, humbly we bow before you this morning as we've come to worship you in truth and in spirit, Father, praying that the things that we say and do today will honor and glorify your high and holy name. As we look at this book of 1 Thessalonians this morning, we thank you, Father, for the message that's contained within it and how it's been able to be passed on through the ages. May we learn from it and apply it to our lives if there are things there that are relevant to us, that we can glean from it, become better tomorrow than we were today. Go with us now through this study, Father. Go with those who are struggling with health issues and problems in their lives. Be with them as we individually pray to you on their behalfs. But go with us this morning as we study this word, your word. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, good morning. We're going to be in the first Thessalonian study this morning. And it's, it's what we refer to in the Bible as a book, chapter, and verses. And what I've always tried to avoid was thinking of them as a book, chapter, and verse. I've tried to remember, and I want to try to instill it in all of us today, this is a letter. And what we're going to be looking at today is just a small portion of that letter. It's a letter from someone to someone, not individual. It's no name spoken of in this first portion that we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at what we know as chapter 1. It's just the first small portion of what was written to this church at Thessalonica. If I only see this, and if you only see this as a letter written to a specific church, a gathering, a group of people, an ecclesia, a called out body of believers, then you're going to be doing a history study. What I like to think of this as, is this is a lesson to this body of believers, to this church where it isn't being spoken of to a individual, it's being spoken to a group of people. That's what we're here doing this morning. We're here to hear what was said in this letter from, as it turns out to be, from Paul to this church at Thessalonians, the church of Thessalonians in Thessalonica. Is it important what Thessalonica represents? Is it important where it's located? Is it important any of its attributes, any of its strengths? I don't know. I'm not a historian. I can tell you a few things about it. I can tell you that in the first century, there was about 200,000 population. I can tell you it's on a trade route. I can tell you it's very close to the water. And so the idea of it being a good trade route location is, is important to the people of that time. But in regards to the church itself, I can't tell you much about it, other than it is comprised of a group of believers that heard the Word of God, they believed it, they accepted it, they made it a part of their lives, and Paul is writing a letter to them, and I know it's Paul because of the first words within this scripture. The ones that we're going to look at, it's going to tell us it's from Paul, Silas, and Timothy, or Sylvanius, your version may say. And what I want to know about it is what is he saying to them and how does it relate to me today? How does it relate to you today? Can you read this First Thessalonian letter and have any relevance in your life? A good many of the letters that Paul writes are in regards to correcting some wrongs, making some ideas to them that what they're doing, they've missed the idea of what they were supposed to be doing and the word's getting back to him, and he's trying to correct them. Not so in this particular portion of the letter, not not here in this letter. And you'll hear that as we go through it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read this first chapter. It's only got 10 verses in it as we see it. And then I'm going to come back and we're going to talk about breaking it down and seeing what it contains and what relevance it has to each of us. So if you're there, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Very short excerpt from a letter that goes on, as we know it, with five chapters. We'll be trying to cover one chapter at a time, trying to get it through us, what it is that he's saying. As I said, he's, he is speaking to a church in a place called Thessalonica. No question about that. We, we know that just from our history already. But if all I see in this is that we have Paul speaking to a church in Thessalonians, and this was all taking place back in 51 AD, then I've got to think to myself, am I doing a history study? Or am I wanting to hear what he said to them? And is it relevant to me? Because if it's just a history study, it has a whole different meaning to me. But if he's trying to relay to you and to I today as a group of believers, then I need to pay attention. I need to be able to glean from it the message that he has within it. And so I will. This was written, from what I understand, approximately 20 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's important. It's important because now we know that these people in Thessalonica are aware of Christ dying, being buried and raised again, and was resurrected unto the Father in heaven. We know that they would know that because that's what Paul would have taught them, the good news, the gospel message. And so we have that assurance. We know that. Now, in Paul's normal graciousness, and most all of his epistles are very gracious in their openings, in their salutations. And this one is no exception. He starts off by saying to the church of Thessalonica, he, he equates with them their understanding of God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, grace to you. It's a good phrase to use when somebody is addressing a believer. Grace to you. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's almost redundant to what he started with. But it's because he wants to reinforce that to them. He wants to make sure that he realizes that they've done good things and that God is aware of it. And he knows this by the inspiration of the Spirit that's within him. So as he relays all of this, he's very gracious in his opening. What Paul acknowledges in this portion of the letter is that what they do, what Paul and other apostles and other evangelists do, they do for your sake. That's important. And I'll tell you why I feel like it's important. When he says, we do what we do for your sake in verse 5, there's many other places that we can look at and we can find out to be weary of those who do something wonderful for great gains, for various gains under various circumstances in various ways. What Paul is making sure that the world knows from that day that he spoke of this to the Thessalonians, unto you and I today that we're hearing it spoken again, he wants to make sure you realize that what Paul has done, why it's being recorded, why it's inspired to him to make sure that you and I hear it, as time moves on, everybody from that day till this day that looks at this letter hears it, it's important to know that what Paul does, he does for the people that are hearing it. That's important. 
because there are so many others who do do good things, trying to express the gospel message, the good news around the world, but they do it for gain. They do it for monetary reasons. They do it for uh, notoriety and, and celebrity ship of sorts. We even see that today, probably more so than in those days. I don't have any way of knowing that. But there are those, it's spoken of in the scriptures, that do do those kind of things for great gains. And Paul's making sure that, that that's known. Another point that he makes that's very important is what he goes on to say in verse 5 when he says that the message, the epistle that we have given you, that you have heard from us, you didn't hear it in just words only. That's what he's trying to tell them. That's how it's done then. They heard the word. There was no question about that. So you'd wonder to yourself, what do you see mean? You didn't hear this in word only. You didn't hear the word in word only. The word is the word of God. We know that from the first part of John. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word. And we know that that's the message that he's speaking of here. But you didn't hear it just by somebody speaking it to you. That's going to become extremely important as we go on. But it's important for you and I to hear this said from Paul to this church because as you will see and hear in just a moment, that's how you got it. You heard the word. You heard it spoken. We'll talk more about that as we go in. Now, how's this done? Well, it's done the same way today as it had been done in those early days, in those first days. What the message did for them was it turned their lives around. It turned them from worshiping idols which we hear about in many, many of, of the scriptures in, in the Bible, it, it turned them from worshiping idols to worshiping the true and living God. It caused them to wait for God's Son to return from heaven. And I said they knew he had resurrected. So it taught them to know that God's Son is going to return from heaven, and it brought them to an understanding to accept Jesus Christ as salvation. Before that, they wouldn't have known that until Paul came and shared that word with them. They wouldn't have been aware of all of that. Remember, this is the early onset of all of this happening. Now, you and I might not be able to equate to that understanding because we have the Bible. And we have all of this history about all of these things that happen and when they happen and who they happen with. These people are just hearing this. This is, like I said, only 20 years after Christ's resurrection, approximately. So that's what the Word of God did for them. It turned them from worshiping idols to worshiping the true and living God. So let me come back to what I said in the beginning. What has it got to do with us? Well, I have a rhetorical question to ask. What has the Word done for you? What has the Word done for you? What has the message, what has the gospel, what has the good news, what has it done for you? Huh? Same, as those. Same as those, absolutely. And that's what you're going to realize here in just a minute. You may not have been worshiping graven images. You may not have been worshiping uh, wooden idols, as we can see in the scriptures. But I can assure you that you were spending a lot of your time doing something other than reading, studying, praying, and seeking godliness and righteousness. I can be confident of that. Now, this is going to come down to a, a little bit of a separation in us. I am a first-generation Christian in the Church of Christ. You may have been raised in a family of believers in the Church of Christ. It may have been that your grandparents were believers in the Church of Christ, and, and, and you may have been introduced to these kinds of things. But that's, that's not what I'm trying to get at here. The idea that they were taken from worshiping idols to worshiping God, in a manner of speaking, so were we. And even to this very day. There are people that idolize sporting events, uh, sporting activities in their lives. And they're going to find that as a priority in their life until somebody tells them there's something more important. And that thing that's more important is understanding God's Word. The Word. And so, 
you may have been worshiping some, something I, that I wouldn't even have an idea about, but I can be confident that before you came to confess Christ, before you became a believer and a follower and a member of the body of Christ, you were doing something other than worshiping the Lord. I have no problem thinking that and believing that. What I have to ask you, what I want you to ponder, is before you heard the word of Christ, before you were, heard the, the written word, did you even know that there was a Christ? And like I say, unless you're a second or third generation Christian, you may not have ever, I mean, you may, you may have heard of Christ. You may have seen a picture of him on your grandmother's wall. Uh, there may have been any one of a number of reasons why you would have heard about Christ. As a first generation Christian, having come to the, to the understanding that I stand before you having confessed now, I didn't know. When they were speaking of Jesus Christ, it was usually in vulgarity. People around me that made that reference are usually using his name in vain. That isn't knowing Christ. And so when I come to find out about this Jesus, this Son of God, it was for the first time. It's something that I was just experiencing. But even if you did know about Christ as a, a, a older generation Christian, did you know that he removed sin? Did you even realize that you lived in sin? That your life was filled with sin? And that this Jesus could save you from that? Did you even realize that he died for your sins and that he was going to return again and take you home to heaven? I mean, that's some tremendously rewarding understanding that we have to have. But did you realize it? I don't know that they did. I'm really confident that they didn't or it wouldn't be spoken of here in this letter that Paul was submitting. Did you realize at any point in time that Jesus Christ was going to forgive you of those sins and he was going to provide for, for you salvation? I don't need to be saved from anything. I don't even know what it means. I don't even know what I've done that needs to be forgiven. I haven't done anything that bad. I didn't live that horribly. I didn't commit those kinds of atrocities. What am I to be forgiven of? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We know that. We hear that elsewhere. But what are we guilty of? And what do we need forgiving from? I don't know. That's up to you to understand that. I can't answer that for you. But what you have to realize is it's spoken of to these people. It is spoken to you and I even today. Did you know Christ before you were introduced to the Word of God? Only you can answer that. And did you know that he forgave sin? Did you know he provided salvation? I don't know those things. You do. And that's what he's rewarding them for, for their understanding of the things that they've turned their lives from worshiping idols to worshiping God. That's the thing he's doing here. He's commending them in the things that he remembers about them. He went in, he taught the word, he brought them all to an understanding and a belief. And not everybody would have done that. Not everybody does that even today. You, you could speak to 100 people and you might just only get one that would be responsive. I preached for 10 years. I don't know how many baptisms we had, but it was pretty small by the comparison of the time I spent and the number of people that heard the word. Jody could say the same thing. Wayne could say the same thing here. As many times the word has been spoken, one of the things that was asked of me many, many times is, don't you get discouraged? You put all this effort into under making people understand the word of God and what Jesus can do for you, and they don't respond? No. And I'll tell you why, no. It's not because I don't care. It's because of what Paul said later. I will plant, Apollos will water, but God will give the increase. I don't have to worry about it. I do my job. I do my part. And we're going to see that come a little bit more in just a minute. But for the time being, there's three phrases that were used in this early part of this letter that I want to emphasize. What Paul said in this early part of the letter was, I am in remembrance of. He remembered something about these people. One of the things that we kind of lose sight of, and I guess it's just human to do so, we lose sight of this communication thing. 
We have so many avenues of communication in our lives. We don't stop to think, how did they get the word? Out of the word? That they were or weren't doing something right or wrong or whatever the case was, might be? How did that get back from Thessalonica over to Philippi? Or wherever Paul might have been at the point in time? It had to travel by people. It had to travel by word. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have all of the things that we have a luxury of today. The very lessons that are spoken of here are, are sent out over the airwaves, are spoken of, and people in their automobiles can sit and listen. They didn't have all of that. And you've got to be amazed by that, how these things get spoken of. And when, when Paul goes on in these following verses, verse 3 and following, about being in remembrance of it, He's reflecting on something that will encourage them. Because the things he's in remembrance of about these people, I can only share with you in regards to something that happens here. And I'll, I'll express that in just a moment. But let me get these three points out first. What he says is, I am in remembrance of your work of faith. I'm in remembrance of your work of faith. I'm in remembrance of your labor of love. Had you contemplated any of that? Had you really let that sink in at all? And he goes on to say that I'm in remembrance of your patience. The patience of your hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Can the same be said for us? Do you have a working faith? That's what he's remembering in these people. Do you have a working faith? That's something only you can answer. Or is your faith stagnant? Is your faith alive and active? Or is your faith dormant and docile? He's commending of what he remembered about them. And it's good to hear that. He went on to say he was in remembrance of their labor of love. Do you do the things that you do? out of a labor of love? Or do you do what you do out of a sense of duty or obligation? It's important to know those things. It's important to think about those things. And I believe that's why it's written in this letter for you and I to have again, to present to us, to remind us of the things that Paul was in remembrance of for this group of people. So you have to ask yourself, is the things that I do, do I do for the Lord? because I love the Lord and I want to reflect the Lord in my life? Do I do them as a labor of love or do I do them because I think I'm supposed to? And it's important that we realize that. And then he said to them that I am in remembrance of your patience, the patience of your hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have patience in your hope? That's a very, very serious question because it can undermine our faith if we do not. Steve. Do you have a remembrance? Do you have patience in your hope? Do you remember the things that were spoken to you that brought you to the Lord? <laughs> well, we won't get into that. There's too many of us that that shoe fits. <laughs> But there are many times when the lesson that's being brought to you hits you in the heart because you're going through something and it affects you because of that. You're absolutely right. 
But these people evidently had a patience of the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ, what had been said to them about Jesus, what Jesus has done or can do for them and continues to do for them and what he will do for them in the days ahead in the resurrection for them, in their future, in their lives. And, and he, he says that. Do you remember Jesus saying, I'll never leave you nor forsake you? Do you believe that? Do you still have patience in that? Because it's easy to have patience in my understanding that the Lord is with me. That he's walking beside me. He's holding my hand. He's guiding me. He's lifting me up. When things are good, I have no problem dealing with that, accepting that, allowing that to enter into my thoughts. But what about when the road gets a little rocky? Do I still have that patience of hope? That's the question you need to ponder. Because it isn't always so. Sometimes I, I, I try to muddle through things on my own and I leave the Lord out of it. In spite of my most favorite passage that says, seek first the Lord. His, seek first God and his righteousness. I don't always do that. We don't always do that. But Paul is commending them because they have a remember, he has a remembrance of the strength of the hope that they have in their faith and the hope that they have for Jesus Christ. What he told them that Jesus did for them, what brought them to the repentance that they had when they did away with the idol worshiping and accepted Jesus Christ. He's, he's remembering that they were a group of people that were so happy as you were the first time you heard the word and you were baptized into Jesus Christ, you came out of that water just jubilant, just on fire for the Lord. I know that because I experienced it too, just as you did. And he's remembering those things. But do we always remember them? Or do we only remember them during the good times? Because the challenge is remembering it during the hard times. And so he's in remembrance of those kinds of things. In verse 5 and 6, we're going to get into a little bit of what Steve just touched on here. It mentions the Holy Spirit. Now, it said that when you heard the word, the word, the message that he gave them, the gospel, the good news, that it was not just in word only. Also involved in the process was the Holy Spirit. Well, when I read that, and it's located in many places throughout the scriptures, this, this introduction to the Holy Spirit, I wonder to myself over the years, why don't we develop more of our lessons about the Holy Spirit? Why do we kind of shy away from lessons about the Holy Spirit? Why do I not speak strongly about this understanding or this knowledge of the Holy Spirit? And as I pondered the thought, it occurred to me that maybe I don't reference it because I don't fully understand it. There's a lot to understand about the Holy Spirit. But what I do in my life, in my understanding of the Scriptures, is that I try to simplify things. And I think the Holy Spirit can be simplified up to a point. Because what I think is the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. I think it's His Spirit. I know it's a part of the Godhead. I know it's part of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. I know that, just as you well know, know that. And I don't understand a lot of what it says about the Holy Spirit coming upon us. But I know there's something that dwells within me that keeps me doing right keeps me walking in the right path, that guides me, that corrects me. Oh, we used to make fun about the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other. We talk about conscience, things we do, we do for, because our conscience would bother us if we didn't. We, we have all kinds of reasons to understand or explain away why we do or don't do what we do or don't do. But when you understand the work of the Holy Spirit that's dwelling within you, that came to you, when you were baptized and dwells within you, then you kind of, kind of come to a better understanding of what's happening here. When he says that it wasn't just by word only that brought you to the understanding of what you ended up believing and confessing and be, being a part of, the Holy Spirit was involved. There is a spirit. And one of the reasons we have such a difficult time understanding this or even explaining it is because it is spiritual. We like things with skin on. Maureen likes to use that expression. She wants someone with skin. It's hard for you and I to understand God, Jesus Christ, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, 
and the Holy Spirit because they're spiritual. And it's hard for us to realize that. It's hard for us to confide in that. But Paul is commending them for their hope that they have in this whole effort. And he wants to remind them that it was a part of what they heard. It was a part of what made them come to the Lord. It was the Holy Spirit working within them. It's the Holy Spirit guiding me, telling me what's right, what's wrong, what to do, what not to do, where to go, what not, where not to go, what to listen to. What am I hearing? What am I really paying attention to? What do I really need to be seeing and saying? That Holy Spirit guides me in a proper way in which I conduct my life. And as long as I'm faithful in all of my understandings to the Lord, the Holy Spirit will work within me. I know that. I'm confident of that. I pray that that's so because I want it to be so. It need, I need it to be so. Because I can't stay in a straight and narrow on my own. I need the guidance of the Lord. That's why I came to the Lord in the first place. I could have continued on in the world. Nothing's stopping me. A good many people do. Not everybody in Thessalonica that heard the word came to the Lord. I am assured of that. Just by common sense. Not everybody that ever heard the word in your realm, in your part of the world, in your relationships, came to the Lord. Some of them outright rejected it. Some of them argued with you about it. And some of them came to the Lord. Some of them accepted it. And thank God for that. In verse 7 and following, what we have here is the process. And there is a process. That's what's going on here. Paul has begun a process. When Paul heard the word, the apostle, not only Paul, but the other apostles, other evangelists, others who spread the word, when they first heard the word, it came from the inspiration of God. We know that. We know that that's how Paul got his inspiration. Uh, that's how he, we know he knows what he knows. It's how we know he can reflect on it, how he can bring it to remembrance because the Spirit is in him. That's what Steve touched on a minute ago. And that's important for us to understand because it is a start to the process. Now, the process obviously starts with God. No question about that. But as far as getting that word out to mankind, it goes through a process. The apostles had the word. They spoke the word to the people. The people heard the word. They spoke the word to another, friend, family, strangers even, anyone that would listen. And from you, the spoken word has sounded forth. I don't know in your life any more than I would wish to express to you everything in my life about who you spoke the word to and what was the response. Because you would probably find a good many of the people that you spoke the word to never responded. And we get a little despondent. We get a little discouraged. We don't like rejection. But they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the Lord. And Paul knows that. And anybody that has studied enough of the word that understands those things, like that little verse I just gave you where Paul planted, Paul is watered, they know that it's God that's going to give the increase. But by the same token, there is this process that takes place. And to those that believe, there is a reason why we are to continue the process. Because there's no other way, none that I have ever heard of, that the word can get out in truth. Now we've got videos, we've got radio communications, we've got I don't know whatever else. I, I'm not, when it comes to electronics, I'm limited. But the point being, it's how the word was spoken then, it's how the word got out then, and it's not changed a bit, in my opinion, until this very day and time. It's still going to be done by people that speak the word. And for you, the word sounded forth. Somewhere along the way, you have spoken to somebody about it. And those that believed it, they accepted it, and the process continued. Here's why we are to do that. It's scriptural. It's a message from God. And it's found in a passage that you probably can, could recite just from memory. It's Mark 16, 15. 
You might need to look it up, but it's okay. I'm going to read it for you anyways. And he said to them, capital H, he, God. The message is from God. He said to them, who's them? The people, the ears of the people. He said to them, go into all of the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. That's the Great Commission. That came from God to you and to I. The Great Commission's been given, and the process will continue as God has directed based on that. But, he says, go into all the world. That's kind of brought up a couple of thoughts in people's mind. What do you mean, going to all the world? I'm supposed to circumvent the globe and, and just go teaching everyone? No. Your world. Go into your world. I don't know whether that's just your front yard, backyard, side yard, your neighborhood. I don't know what that is. Your, your, your field of friends is different, every one of us. I don't know how big your world is. But what he's telling us is go to where you go. Go to your world and speak to everybody. Now that comes with a little bit of problem as well. This whole idea about the Great Commission instructing you and I to do this, this is not just given to the people of Thessalonica in that day and time. We know that. This is to all who believe, all who have accepted Christ, even to this very moment in time. And that includes you and I. That's something we are supposed to do. Now, as I wrap up this first chapter, I want to reflect on us. Because today, we don't have Paul or another apostle or anyone like that to travel region to region, including Marion County, Ocala, Florida, and the Central Church of Christ. We don't have that. So what's supposed to happen as time moves on? If not Paul, I mean, if he's only addressing this to Paul and to the other apostles, if not Paul, then who? Who's going to keep doing this? Who's going to go into all of the world and spread the good news to every creature? How's it going to get done? If not Paul, then you and I. That's who. And I and you, we have a tremendous responsibility in doing that. It's a blessing, it's a joy, it's a privilege, but it is difficult. Go into all of the world, each one of us are told, and preach the word. Those that hear it, believe it, accept it, they're going to be saved. But be assured, friends, not everybody that hears it is going to believe it. Not everybody that hears it is going to accept it. Don't let that discourage you. The question is, do we do that at any level? Do any of us do that at any level? Well, if we do, then how do we do that? In verse 5, it said that the gospel did not come to you in word only. Let me just explain, if I may, what I believe would be the great help to anyone who has a problem with cold canvassing. Now, I use that phrase, cold canvassing, assuming that you understand what cold canvassing is. And just in case you don't, two young men come to the front of your house on their bicycles. They're dressed in nice clothes. They've got a white shirt on and they get a book in their hand, and they come knocking on your door. That's all I need to say about that. You understand cold canvassing. I couldn't do that. I am not the type of person who can approach somebody and just start talking to them about the gospel message or the good news, and you may not be able to either. You may have that same problem. However, I don't believe it. everyone who came to the Lord came because someone spoke words to them. As I pointed out in verse 5. Now I've told you this story time and time again. I'm going to tell you one more time. Maureen and I came to the Lord because of the lifestyle example. And the key word there is the example. And you'll know why that's a key word in just a moment. 
but it was because of the lifestyle example of one of our neighbors. Because their world that they were evangelizing in was in their neighborhood at that time. It may have gone further, I'm sure it did, and I'm sure it still continues to. But at that point in time, Maureen and I saw the lifestyle example of one of our neighbors, how they lived, how they raised their children, how they dealt with personal tragedy and their priorities in life. Now you, as with me, may not be able to quote book, chapter, and verse, but you can tell people what the Lord has done in your life. You can make that kind of an application. You can do that. You can have faith. You can have love. And you can have patience, as is being pointed out here, that's being commended to this church here. And it's commended to you as well. You can do that. How do I know you can do that? The Bible tells me I can do that. If I'm a strong enough believer to come to the Lord in the first place, to accept Jesus Christ, to be baptized in his name, to be raised from the watery grave of baptism, to walk a new life, then I know that because Galatians tells me that I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that lives, it's Christ that lives within me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son, the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's how I know I can do that. Because that's exactly what's being spoken of in these final verses. In verse 7, so that you became examples, he said to these people. You became examples. We can't all go preaching the word. We can't all use words to express what we understand and know and think that we ought to relate to others. But we can live a lifestyle that they can see Christ living within us. And in that process, it will continue. They will see it. Believe me. Trust me. I know this personally. And it will do the job it's intended to do. He said in verse 7, so that you people there in Thessalonica, your example went forth, became an example to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believed. Now that's just an expression of the region that that covered. That's all that is. It may be in your life that it was just a neighborhood. It was just a family membership or grouping. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. That's not the message. For from the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. And your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. I don't need to keep reinforcing within myself the point that I just tried to get across to us today. It's not something that I, I'm under any kind of pressure or compulsion to do, it's something I must love to do. It's called labor of love. That's what he's commending these for. And the, the faith that he gives him credit for, that's what drives you to do this. And the patience and the hope of what the Lord Jesus Christ has set in motion for you and I, the hope of a home in heaven when this life is over, that's something that not only should we appreciate, but it's something we should want for our other friends, family, strangers, anyone that we meet. It's important that we continue to do that so that the process will continue. I'm finished with it a little early, but it's all there is to it in this first few verses. And next week, we'll look at chapter 2. Is there any questions or comments before we close? All right. Thank you very much. The lesson... Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Linnell? When we give someone a Bible, we ought to write right in the front of it. To you, from God. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, people. I appreciate your attention.